Merry Christmas. Good morning, everyone. We welcome you to Christmas service and this wonderful opportunity for us to praise and bless our Lord Jesus Christ. We are going to open with, oh, come all ye faithful. So everyone, please stand. <laughs> Oh 
chão e a dos outros. Spiritual work. We apologize. It is Christmas morning and we're all very excited. <laughs> short uh, little children's message this morning, but everybody looks, but everybody looks so pretty. So the guys, we look like guys, we just have our flannels on, and <laughs> while the girls are all dressed in the nice and nice and pretty with their dresses, except for the rice boys, you got to do with us other guys that with your cool sweaters. But anyway, who had fun this morning? No, everybody a little tired? Who stayed up really late last night? Because they're excited. Yeah, yeah. Miss Jessie did. She was super excited. <laughs> All right. Well, there's nothing to be scared of in the dark. All right. Super excited for Christmas and you're. Right. Whoa, that's late. I think we were up like way later than that. But anyway, let's talk about Pastor Rusty's message on redeemed and adopted. So we have to understand what those words mean. So who knows what the big word redeemed means? <coughs> Nobody? I don't, I don't even have the definitions up. Uh, it's a super simple message. So redeemed means to, to pay the price, to, redeem, to uh, gain possession by paying the price for something. And then adopted, who, now that's a little bit easier. We might understand what adopted means. So who knows what adopted means? I don't know. Yeah, something. So what we, okay, we can either adopt animals. We can adopt children. Pets. Oh, okay, we can use pets in general. Yep, pets. So we go to a store typically, and we go pick out a, pu a typically a puppy or a kitty, and we go and we pay money, and we get to bring that animal home. So adopted in this sense means that somebody chose us to be our father. So in, in other words, somebody is our father, and they picked us by name. Now, who does that sound familiar to anybody? I'm going to give you a hint. We're celebrating his birthday. Is that it today? We're celebrating Christmas, yep, but his, <laughs> but his name is Jesus, right? So Jesus, 
he paid that price to redeem us of our what? Our sins, right? So verse 5 is what I want to look at. Verse 5 says, to redeem those... Uh, to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. All right, so to redeem those to, uh, in other words, next slide, please. This is how, who, who saw the, uh, the, the video of like the adults on Anchor Kids Night? Uh, the adults were talking like little kids, and it was through uh, the Bible through a children's mind, right? So now, this is kind of how we can break this verse down so it makes more sense to you guys. So that we might pay the price for our sins because we broke God's commandments, the law, the commandments. And that he will be our father when we believe in Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior. Now, that's still a lot of words, isn't it? It's actually more words, but now we don't have fancy words in there. Cause, so all we have to do is understand that Jesus, why was he born? Jesus, to, to, to pay the price for our sins, to redeem us of our sins that separate us from God. That's why today is so special, right? Right, and nobody's excited. I bet if I had a present up here, you guys would be excited. <laughs> All right, so who wants to close in prayer so we can, who's got other families that they have to go see today? More presents to open? So we got to get out of here, so Pastor Rusty's got to come up. Oh, you got some presents? You want to pray? All right. Who wants to pray? So we can. All right. Thank you, God, for everything. Thank you for what you provided for us. Thank you for all of my friends. Thank you for my teacher. Thank you for dying on the cross for our sins. Amen. Amen. All right, guys. Let's go and finish worshiping Jesus. Everyone, please stand.
All right, church, you may be seated. Well, good morning and Merry Christmas. It is good to be with you all this morning. It's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. We are here to gather to celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus. We celebrate one of the most important moments in all of human history. Now, if you think about it, all of human history is divided by one single point. And that is the birth of Jesus. Nowadays, they try to take it out. You know, A.D., B.C., they're changing it. It's now B.C.E., before current era, and C.E., current era. But let me ask you a question. What defines those eras? (laughs) Still the same event. Well, praise God that you all are here this morning. I hope you got some breakfast, some coffee, maybe a present or two. This morning we are going to be looking at Galatians chapter 4, verses, uh, our main focus is going to be verses 4 and 5, but we're going to read uh, verses 1 through 7. And we're going to focus on this idea of being redeemed and adopted, but we'll see as we read that there is an event that happens at the fullness of time. And we'll see what that is. I know I just told you to sit down, but let's stand and read the word of God. I apologize. <laughs> Oops, this guy don't want to stand up. There we go. Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. Let's read along. Turn to your Bibles. I like hearing pages flip. That's nice. It's a good sound. It says, now I say, as long as the heir is a child, he does not defer, uh, he does not differ at all from slave, although he is owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. So also we, while we are children, we are held in bondage under the elemental things of this world. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive adoption as sons. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into the hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer slave, but a son. And if a son, then you are an heir through God. Woo! That is something to praise the Lord about this morning. Let's pray over his word. Father, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for bringing bringing us together, that we may worship you as we celebrate your birth Because we know that it was the first step into an awesome process to see your children saved. Then that is something worth celebrating every day. Father, let me be your instrument this morning. Speak through me. Use your spirit to go in and out of these pews. To to speak to hearts this morning. And to know that we can have everlasting life and be heirs of yours because you care for us, that we become part of your family, God. Not just servants, but family. We love you, Jesus, and we praise you and thank you. And that through this morning, that you would be seen, that you would be magnified, that you would be glorified, and that people would see Jesus this morning. We love you, Lord, and it is in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. You guys may be seated. So this might not be the the Christmas message that y'all were thinking about. Maybe you're going to come to church, you're going to get some Luke chapter 2, maybe some Matthew 1, a little bit thrown in there. But we're going to be here here in Galatians, and we're going to be looking at this idea. 
So let's give you a little, uh, like I always like to do, I like to give you a little background of the book and who they, they were talking to so we have an idea of why Paul was saying what he was saying to the people he was saying it to, okay? So the book of Galatians was written by Paul to the area of Galatia. It is uh, this area in now modern-day Turkey. Uh, if you could bring that map up, it's kind of the center section of Turkey. So if you can see, I know it's kind of difficult. Thank you, Dan. That little area right there is Galatia. And this actually holds uh, four, or, four or five uh, of the, uh, when you read Revelation, the churches of Revelation. So this is really cool, really important area. And... What happens here is Paul wrote this letter out of correction. He, he was actually kind of upset at what was happening in the, in the Galatian area because Jews, Christian Jews, were coming into the area and into the churches of Galatia saying that you have to hold to the law, that you don't have to just believe in faith, but you also have to keep the law. So Paul, being both a Jew and a uh, and a Roman citizen, he's like, no, you guys got this all messed up. It's backwards. We, we don't have to do this. So the whole book of Galatians is f- facing that idea of we need to keep the law and believe in faith. No, you just need faith. No, you need the law and faith. It's this whole back and forth. And Paul addresses that issue through the whole book. So if that's something that you um, are interested in or something that like you've heard people talk about or something that you're struggling with, read the book of Galatians. It, Paul lines it out uh, pretty strongly that it is a work of faith, or it, it is a act of faith, not of works, that, uh, that we come to salvation and that we are sanctified and glorified through faith. So <clears throat> in chapter 2, Paul actually calls this whole idea of holding to the law and faith as a false gospel. So if we see it come up today where we have to hold to the law and have faith, it's a false gospel. Paul has addressed it in the very first century of the church. Chapter 3, as we're walking through this, explains the intent of the law. So Paul goes over and says, this is the point of the law. This is why the law was given. And he says, now righteousness comes through faith and not through the law. And we can see that in Uh, chapter 3, verses 11 through 14, and we'll get there a little bit later. But where we're going to be, we're going to be in chapter 4, the first little section here. It offers a more intimate and personal understanding of the work of Christ and how we are now to know him in this age of his spirit, in in the church age of when he works through his spirit and through uh, through his spirit power. Point number one, we're going to look at redeemed and adopted, the child and the slave. Paul gives a, a metaphor here or, or an example of a child and a slave. So what we're going to look at here is the, uh, for, uh, verse one. Now I say, as long as the heir is a child. Now the heir is a child. This is kind of a, let's define heir for a second. An, an heir is a person who is legally entitled to the property of someone on the act of them dying. So think of like royalty. Like a prince becomes a king, he inherits, he is the heir to the throne, but he only inherits the throne when his father, the king, is unable to fulfill either unable to fulfill his role or he dies, which at that point you would be unable to fulfill your role anyway. That's the Webster Dictionary, I guess you could say. But the Baker Bible Encyclopedia says it like this. It says, one who inherits something or who is entitled to a future inheritance. We see that concept throughout Scripture that we have a future inheritance through Christ. Now, in the kingdom of God, those who have made Jesus their Lord are heirs, but we're not just heirs. We become children. We become adopted into the Lord's family. We get a glimpse of how this happens in verse 1, but it's not really explained by Paul until 4 and 5. The word child has this idea of like minor, like we would say child up until what, 18. They're like, okay, now you're an adult. You hit the magical number, you're now an adult. But by Jewish and Greek cultures, it 
a lot of times you would meet the requirements and then they would celebrate it. You would have a big celebration uh, in the case of Jewish people coming of age, Jewish children coming of age. You have mitzvahs. You have a bar mitzvah and a bat mitzvah. And that's 13. They poof, they become adults in the Jewish uh, culture. And they used to do the kind of the same thing in Greek culture, but it's a little more complicated. But the cool thing is, Paul was a Jew and a Roman. And when he wrote this, he was kind of, kind of in both, both mindsets. So when he says that they become an heir, the, of the, he's talking about the child, he's kind of mixing both together where it's like, okay, they're going to come of an age, but in Rome, it wasn't necessarily an age that you got to, but it was your father's decision of when you were appropriately uh, mature. So you could be 45. And if your father was still alive, he's like, nope, you are dumb and I don't trust you with anything and you wouldn't be considered an adult yet. But if you were a mature child, you know, you could have been 12 and your father said, yeah, I trust you with half my estate. Here it is. Then it's kind of that idea. So we see Paul walk through this and we get a glimpse of how Christ sees us that not only are we heirs, but we are children too. So, excuse me. Further on in in verse 2, he says, As long as he is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all. Think of an ancient, wealthy household. The young boy was definitely under more scrutiny. He was under more rules and, and regulations than probably the highest slave that his father owned. His fa- because we think of slavery as like shackles, bonds, whips, go out and do as I say. Ancient slavery was a little bit different. Uh, not to dive into ancient slavery, but it was more like... If I had a debt and I couldn't pay it, I could sell myself to somebody and be like, hey, look, I'll come work for you. I I will do as you say. I will become your servant. I will serve you until my debt is paid, and then I can pay myself off, and then I can leave. That was the most common form of slavery. Now, there was the, the slavery of bondage and shackles and whips and all that, but it was mostly that. It was mostly, hey, I, I can't pay for anything. I'm homeless. I don't have anything. I will become a servant. Now, if he was a good servant, you'd be, you could become a bond servant, which means that you could say, hey, I don't want to leave. I want to keep working for you. Paul addresses four of his books as a bond servant of Christ. He says, I don't want to leave. I want to, I want to keep serving you. So this idea is that there can be servants that have higher and more freedom than a minor child. Okay, that's, that's all I'm trying to get at. <laughs> so when the, when the boy is just a child, he, he probably has less day-to-day authority than a high-ranking slave, but he is destined to inherit everything that the slave can't. The fact is that an heir is under strict care and guidance and, a, and is stewarded, and at a stewarded time, he will be able to inherit what his father is giving him. A slave cannot inherit what the Father has. Verse 3 starts off, so also we, or even so we. Now comes the comparison to, to this idea of servitude and a minor child to us in our spiritual state. Even so we, when we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. We are sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. We see this in Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. It says, for, all, for, for you all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Now we are also all heirs according to his promise, which is in 3.29. He says, and if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to a promise. Abraham's promise was to the entire, God's promise to Abraham was for the entire world world. It says every nation will be blessed, and we see that through the lineage of Abraham all the way down to Jesus himself, that that promise was supplied through the birth of Christ, that every nation is blessed with the gift of salvation just like he promised Abraham. 
Now he says the law is our guardian and is to watch over us while we were children. That's what these elemental things are. The, the elemental things of earth is kind of the law that holds us into bondage while we're still young, while we're still children. The law affects, has an effect on our corrupt nature and it brings us into bondage under the elements of the world. So Galatians chapter 3, verse 24 and 25 Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ. This is Paul's. So that we may be justified by what? Faith. The law is our tutor to point us to Christ so that we can be justified by what? The law? No. We are justified by faith in Christ. Verse 25, but now that faith has come, we no longer are under a tutor. The law is the tutor that teaches us and shows us and says, look to the Messiah. And when we look to the Messiah, we see Christ. He says, do you have faith in Christ? Yes, I have faith in Christ. We step out of the bondage of the law into the faith and grace of Christ. So he's painting this very strong comparison that says, you no longer need the law because we are justified by faith because of the work of Christ, because the law was pointing to Christ the whole time. Verse 3, the elemental things of the world. Now, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but the elemental things of the world is saying that the world is set up in an ABC manner. Like, we walk in the ABCs, we learn how to speak in a certain way, how we learn from little things to big things. We don't just jump into, uh, you know, doctors don't just jump into brain surgery. Like, they work their way up to it. The elemental things of this world are compared to the ideas of um, karma, the idea of like, I do X, so I get X. I do this, so I, like, I do good, so I get good. I do bad, so I get bad. That's kind of the idea of the elemental things is that you do, you get cause and effect. The idea of Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection goes in the opposite order of what the elemental, it says, when he says elemental, elements of the world, he is also saying that this is how the world was set up, and Christ comes to say, you are no longer under those standards. So he's saying, you do X, you stay under the law, the law says don't do, you say, okay, I don't do. Christ comes and says, I've fulfilled that. I don't need that. You are now justified by faith so that you don't have to be held under that any longer. Now, this idea of like the ABC universe is not a bad idea because like obviously you do something, something's going to happen, right? You go out, you, you do something nice for somebody, they'll, you'll probably do something nice for you. Like it's just kind of what happens. But it's not something that we hold our salvation to. It's not something that we hold every part of our life to, where it's like we work to do good things so that good things happen to me. No, we do good because there is none righteous but God, and God wants us to and desires us to be good, to be like Him. Paul calls this a, a false teaching according to these elemental principles. In Colossians 2, verse 8, he says, C2 that there is no one that takes you captive through philosophy or empty deception in accordance with human tradition, in accordance with elementary principles of the world, rather than the accordance with Christ. See the element, the elemental principles? That's that idea of you do X, you get X. So uh, think of Roman and Greek worship of I go pray to X, I hope to get this. I go make sacrifice to this, I hope to get this. But it says, don't get caught up in philosophies, empty deceit, traditions of men, because it's all based in that false uh, dichotomy, because it's not according to who? Christ. 
In Jesus, we die to this elemental principles of the world. In Colossians 2, verse 20, it says, If we have died with Christ to the elemental principles of the world, why, as if you are living in the world, do you submit yourself to their decrees or regulations? He says, If you have died to Christ, why are you tethered? Why are you stuck? Why do you go back to the things of the world? It's a challenge for all of us to to examine our own hearts of, do we find ourselves submitting ourselves and going back to the regulations that we have been freed from, from the sins that we've been freed from, the shackles that we've been freed from, the relationships we've been freed from, all of these things that God says you no longer need, are you sending yourself back to those standards, or are we living in the righteousness of Christ? Point two, he says... uh, Redeemed and adopted, free from our bondage. Free from our bondage. Verses uh, 4 and 5 start off with, But when the fullness of time had come. The idea behind this phrase is that when the time was right, when it was perfect. You ever have something happen in your life and you're like, man, that was just perfect timing. You're like, man, God just knew exactly what I needed when I needed it, and it just showed up exactly when I needed it. I always like the the cliche, God is not, God's never late. He's always on 11.59.59, so like 11 p.m. If he says midnight, it's 11.59 and 59 seconds. He's never late. He's right on time when he's supposed to be. But he says in his perfect timing, When the fullness of time had come, when it was perfect and ready and ripe. Think of like a fruit that you go out and you've been like, for for my farmers and growers out there, gardeners, when you've been babying that little apple like up on your tree or your peach and you're like, no bird has touched this, no worm has got it, this is my baby, I'm, I'm, I'm just waiting for the day when it's perfect and I can just pull it off and it's perfect. That's the idea of when God says the fullness of time. He says it was perfect. My standard is perfect. My timing is perfect. So when that perfect time arose, what happened? He sent forth his son. Just like God sent forth his son in the perfect timing, he will send forth his son again. A second time. And this time he does not come as a a lamb. He comes as a lion. God sent forth his son when the timing was right. To be born of a woman. To be born under the law. Now when that time had come. His redemption plan was perfectly prepared. The time was also right for my, for my prophecy, biblical prophecy nerds here. The timing was right because it was 483s prophesied after Daniel. And not to get too deep into that end, but Daniel prophesies these 70 weeks in Daniel. And each of them represent years. Long story short, these years add up to Uh, to a prophecy of the Messiah to come, and those years add up to 483 years. From that point, 483 years, Jesus was born. Again, a miracle, a statistical anomaly, something that could never happen unless it was orchestrated by God himself. Verse 4, he says, But God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law. Jesus came not only as the Son of God, but as one born of a woman, born under the law. The eternal Son of God in heaven added humanity to his deity and became man and to be born under the law. Born of a woman was obviously a reference to the virgin birth of of himself through his mother Mary. But he was born to be under the law. Jesus was not above the law, but he was subject to it while he was in human form. 
So he had to partake in the law because what was he going to do? He says, I didn't come to abolish the law, but I came to fulfill the law. So what's he say in verse 5? Why did he come? To redeem those who have been under the law. Redeem. Remember, redeemed and adopted. This is our first word, to redeem those who are under the law so that we might receive the adoption. Redeem, because Jesus is God and he has the power and resources to redeem us. Because Jesus is man, he has the right and ability to redeem us. He's the only one that has the right to redeem us. He, had, he came to purchase us out of the slave market from our bondage of sin and from the elements of the world. Now, if you don't know this, John Newton, the writer of Amazing Grace, he, his mother died when he was seven years old. He jumped aboard a ship and became a, became a slaver. He became uh, really, really well-known in the slave trade in the uh, 1740s, 1750s, or uh, 1740s. But when he was 23 on March 10th, 1748, when his ship was about to sink off the coast of Newfoundland, he cried out to God for mercy, and God saved him from that wreck. He never forgot how amazing God was and received him. To keep it fresh in his memory, he fastened a cross over the wall of his fireplace and had these words from Deuteronomy 15.15. 15, you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord Yahweh your God redeemed you. We were a slave and a bond, and we were bound to sin. Jesus was born. We celebrate this day that he was born for a reason, and that was to redeem us from our bonds and servitude to sin so that we can go and sin no more. As we see Jesus speak many, many times, go and sin no more. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 11 through 14, we see that starting in verse 11, now that, one, that, no, now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident. So take a second, reread that. But no one is justified by the law in the sight of God. Like, so what were the Israelites doing for a thousand years? If they're not justified by, by, by the law that they had to keep. Because in, in Hosea, or sorry, Habakkuk, it says the just shall live by faith. They knew, they knew that they could not be justified by the law that it was faith that justified them in who God was and is. Verse 12, he says, However, the law is not of faith. On the contrary, he says, He who practices them shall live by them. Leviticus 18.5. That means the man who does them shall live by them. That means that you are a slave to the law. You are a slave to, to what, that, uh, what the law is telling you. Because if you see it, to believe it, then it's not faith. And what are we justified by? Faith. 14, in order... Oh, sorry, uh, 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. Hallelujah. Rede redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it was written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. That's found in Deuteronomy 12, 23. In order that Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham, might come to the Gentiles so that we would receive a promise of the Spirit through faith. Again, the promise has been redeemed through faith. Jesus took it upon himself to be the fullness of the curse of the law, the fullness of the whole law, becoming an accursed man being hung on a tree so that he could redeem us by, by paying the full ransom of all mankind for my sins and your sins, not only to purchase, purchase us into his possession, but to adopt us into his family. And not only are we just adopted into his families, we are heirs and co-heirs with Christ for all eternity in Jesus 
This Christmas morning, we celebrate his birth, but we need to know why. We need to know why he was born. Why did he come? Why is it the greatest story ever told? I preached a message uh, two or three years ago. It said it didn't end there. The idea that Christ was born, but guess what? It doesn't end there. It's the same thing today, that we celebrate his birth and we understand why, but guess what? It doesn't end there. There's more to the story, church. So that that last part there, he says that we might receive the adoption as sons. It would be enough that we were purchased out of the slave market, but God's work for us does not end there. We were elevated to a place of sons and daughters by God's adoption. Every human being is made in the image of God, but not every human being is a child of God. Let me say that again. Every human being is made in the image of God, but not every person is a child of God. Because the distinction between a child is that we have given ourself to the Lord and we have been adopted into his family. Because scripture says in John 8, 44, he speak, Jesus speaking to the Pharisees, he says, you are of your father who? The devil. Can you be a child of God and the child of the devil? What's the distinguishing factor between the two? Faith in Christ. Believing in who he is. I found this very, very interesting. The Roman custom for adoption, when a son was given, uh, the son was given absolute equal opportunity as a, reg- as a, as a born son, as a, as a flesh and blood son. When they were adopted into the family, they were given the same privileges as a flesh and blood son son, which means he was given equal status, he could go where they went, he could stay where they stayed, he could do what they did, and he was an equal uh, inheritor, he was an equal heir to his family. Christ sees us the same way, we are equal and adopted into his family. We get to experience a very similar way of life that Adam had in the garden because we, Adam got to walk with Jesus. Like he got to physically walk and talk with Jesus, which I think is the coolest thing. But we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit inside of us. If we have given our heart and life to Christ, we should be able to to think of that of like, man, I have direct access to God all the time. I can talk to him. I can be with him. I can commune with him. But how often, myself included, are we like, well, I got really busy today and I didn't, I didn't spend any time with God. Now, if you had a direct line to like, I don't know, I don't want to say President of the United States because nobody would call him. <laughs> um, I don't know, think of, think of somebody you'd actually like to call. <laughs> I say that in jest. Uh, but uh, think of somebody that, that like, you don't have access to right now, but you would love to have like, just on a quick dial. Like You could just one button and, and call them. We have that with God all the time, and we overlook it all the time. And point three, redeemed and adopted, celebrating our sonship, slash daughter, daughtership. <laughs> chapter six, or not chapter six, verse six. Because you are the sons, because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Because you are sons. He says, because, he says, because of all of this, you get to cry out, to God and say, Abba, Father. 
cool thing is about Abba, it doesn't strictly translate to Father. Uh, it actually translates over to like more of intimate uh, and personal. Like uh, Abba is actually Daddy. Like it's actually like what you would call your dad if you were in his house. So if you're just sitting there eating dinner and like you have a nickname for your dad, that's what you would say. Like you would something close and intimate. Uh, because I, I don't know about most of you guys, but I don't go up, I would feel really weird being like, Father, thank you for letting me eat dinner tonight, Father. It's dad, pops, uh, papi, like, uh, I, there's, there's a ton for me and my dad. <laughs> and as we get more children, they get more nicknames for him, so like we yell really random things across the house. But think about it that way. He says, now that you have the spirit of the Son of God inside you, you can, you can shout, you can cry out and say, Dad. Because the Hebrew for that, if you wanted to say Father more specifically, it'd be Av. A, we would say Av. It would be Av. Uh, but Abba is Daddy. Intimate. It's so cool. When we, get this, when we receive the Holy Spirit, we have the opportunity to cry, Dad. Who'd you call when like, something messes up? Dad. Uh, Dad, my water heater's not working. I don't pick it up and be like, <clears throat> Father, I seem to have uh, misplaced a wrench or two. <laughs> when you pop a tire, who do you call? Not AAA. Don't say AAA. <laughs> Sometimes. You call dad. You say, dad, what do I do? I, I've never changed a tire. Like, dad, I need some help. What happens when you run out of money? Dad, can you help me out? I need a little bit of money. Like, I'm really down. When you're really in trouble, who do you call? Your mom. <laughs> Mom, don't tell Dad. <laughs> but who always finds out? Dad. Who comes to the rescue? Dad. <laughs> but that kind of intimacy, that kind of crying out, that kind of, uh, of pursuit we have with the God of the universe. He's not just some floaty up there being. He is the God, the creator, the one who knit you in your mother's womb, the one who knows you more personally and intimately than anybody in this room or this world, who cares about you more than anybody. He says, call out to me. Call out to me. Say, Dad, I need you. And you notice that he says the word cry, crying out. It's not just like, and our hearts whisper, Dad. I'm just thinking of like if you're, if you're lost as a child and you're with your parents some people cry out mom but when you really need protect like you need when you desire your father when you desire like that like the person that you are looking for is your dad you don't just go you're like dad Dad, hey, hey, Dad, Dad. Now you, you, get, you get up, you're like, Dad, Dad, I need you. What, you, you have a bad dream. D Dad, I'm scared, I need you. Can you check my closet for monsters? You cry out for him. We need to cry out for the Lord. And all of this, all of this is possible. All of this happens. All of this is because when God saw the fullness of time, when he said, it is ready, it is time, that is what he did. He stepped out, became a man, was born of a virgin, lived a perfect life, got, was a curse on a tree, became sin for us, died, and rose again so that he says, I have conquered death, so therefore you can conquer death. He says, therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. That is the declaration. He says, I did all of this. I went through all of this. I sacrificed everything for you so that I can call you son. I can call you daughter. You can be with me. 
God did not have to do this. But in his sovereign plan for the entire universe, he saw it fit to say, nope, I'm going to redeem them. He could have wiped us out. He could have said, you messed up, gone. But did he? No. He showed perfect love, perfect sacrifice for us because he decided that it was the perfect time to come down and be born of a virgin and to die on a cross so that we can be redeemed, we can be purchased by the blood of Jesus, and we can be, when we are redeemed, when we have been purchased, what's he do? He adopts us as sons. Sons are no longer slaves, and slaves are no longer sons in their father's house. Jesus illustrated this in the parable of the prodigal son. When the son was determined to return to his father as a slave, his father refused and would only receive him as a son. Think about that. When he deserved to be a slave, what was he received back as? A son. And all of this happens through Christ. Our release from slavery to sonship, the spirit of Jesus in our hearts, and our status as heirs of God are all birthrights given to us by Jesus. Not by anything we do, not by anything we can earn, not by anything we will ever do. It is all a gift, the perfect gift. The one gift that we should be celebrating today more than any other day is the gift of Christ. These are all things that we should be living in and enjoying every single day in our Christian life. So, to wrap this up, Jesus... He was born of a virgin, became a human being for the sole purpose of redeeming the world through his sacrifice on a cross. In this process, he adopts us into his royal family, the royal family, the family of families. He is the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. We are adopted into the most perfect family as children and heirs to his kingdom forevermore. We have a choice, though. Today, we can hold to his promise of redemption and adoption through his sacrifice on the cross only if we have given ourselves over to the lordship of Jesus. That's how we receive that gift. Or, if Jesus does not rule and reign over your life this morning, he is calling you out today to surrender to him and to be adopted redeemed, adopted into his family today. Let's stand and... and We will have invitation as normal. The altar is open as it always is. But my challenge for believers is simple. Don't get caught up in what today could be. But be present in the reason why today is important. Family is good. Gifts are good. The time we spend together is good. But the purpose of today is to worship the Lord Jesus with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So let's not do our one hour this morning and ditch Jesus for the rest of the day or the rest of the week and just come back Sunday and recharge our little church membership card gift of salvation, the wonderful gift that you have given us of your son. We praise you for giving us the time that we can set aside a day or a season to celebrate your birth. And then right around the corner, Lord, we celebrate your resurrection. Father, be with each one this morning. 
if someone needs to come pray at the altar and lay anything at your feet, Lord, that we would do it this morning as we sing our invitation song. We love you, Lord, and we praise you. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. As we sing, the altar is open to come and lay at the Lord's feet. Good, amen. Yeah. Do we have any announcements? I don't think we have any announcements. No Wednesday, no Wednesday service. Or, yes, no, no kids, no, um, what's that called? Anchor kids, thank you. No anchor kids this week. Um, are we having Wednesday night service this Wednesday? Wednesday service is canceled for this week, uh, and if no one else has anything, I have nothing. I love you all very much. Merry Christmas, blessings, and uh, let's sing our closing hymn together.